Hi, I'm Rob Afuso. You're listening to Sydney Taylor at Metal From The Inside. You've tuned in to the most crazy rocking metal podcast on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Metal From The Inside. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me on this week's episode. I know we kind of, it was a little bit in setting this up. Both of our schedules are a little crazy, but we finally made it work. Thank um, you so your, thank you for your patience. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, you know, Skid Row is one of those bands and I want to get into other stuff that you do too, sure. of course, because you're more than, you're more than just Skid Row. But, you know, Skid Row is one of those bands that for me, when I was really getting into this type of music was so important to me. And, uh, you know, I, God, I, I would listen to, you know, this 18 in life, you know, over and over and over again when I was younger, because it was just one of those songs that I loved. It really got me into this, you know, genre of music and uh, just for me personally. So um, you're doing a lot, you know, right now, like I said, you know, you're still, I know, I feel like a lot of times people only kind of look at you for, you know, working with Skid Row, which of course is a huge part of your career, but right now you're teaching lessons, you're even teaching a course at Mount St. Mary College, which, you know, I, I just graduated with a degree in music business, so to, you know, see that you, you were teaching that was pretty cool, so if you want to talk a little bit just about, you know, what you've been up to and, uh, you know, teaching that course and just all that kind of fun stuff you've been up to as of late. Uh, sure, well, you know, obviously Skid Row, um, gave me a platform to do all these other things. I mean, of course I could give lessons and, and teach uh, at school, but obviously that um, makes it a whole lot easier <laughs> to, for, for people to want you. Um, but, um, you know, and, and yes, Good Row was a, a huge part of, of my life and uh, probably a third of my life, actually. And um, I guess, Early on in Skid Row, it was about 1992, I think. It was just just around Slave to the Grind time. Um, I just decided we were out on the road and just playing hard rock, heavy metal all the time. And every night I'd come back to the bus and I'd lay lay down in the bunk and I'd put on Motown music or soul, old soul. And I was like, wow, I loved you know the horn section. I loved the the multiple singers up front doing the so I started this. I started a band because I just loved that music. Uh, back in it was 1993, I started called Soul System. I know Paul Stanley's now doing something similar. I've uh, I've had you know had this passion for this music for a long time. So I started this band back then, and um, you know we'd be out on the road doing Slave to the Grind with Pantera, and then I'd come home and I'd play Motown with Soul System. <laughs> And it was a really, it's just a really nice balance of life, you know. I was just said to people, you know, it's who wants to eat steak every night of the week, you know, of your life. So it, it was a nice balance. Um, so Soul System, Soul System um, sort of morphed into a company with its success. It was just a really great band. And so now the company does high-end events around the world. Events meaning private events, for, you know, say for like American Express, uh, for instance, or large banks, insurance companies, um, and as and um, celebrity high-end weddings, things of that nature. So we do that, and um, and you know, I'm, uh, with with COVID, there was no playing. There, you know, there's no playing live, and um, so I started. I went back into educating and teaching, and I, I really found myself enjoying that again. Um, you know, because I haven't, I haven't really, with Skid Row, I didn't read music. There's no need to read music. It was all from the soul. Uh, so it was really nice to get back into reading music, um, which I, I did a good part of my life. Um, so it's sort of, in teaching, I also retaught myself how to read. Um, and it's been, it's been really fun having this teaching experience. And then, um, I'm just giving you a little vignettes here. Yeah. Through, you know, what, what, what I've been up to. And then also, uh, this was actually pre-COVID. I had gotten a call from a local university, uh, Mount St. Mary um, College, and just asked if I'd be interested in being on the business school advisory board. And I'm like, sure, <laughs> I'll, I'll advise your business, whatever. So, um, so in that, I had this, all of a sudden, I had this passion to create a, a, a class that I saw that they had a business, they have a business school, but no music and no, nothing in music or entertainment production. I said, well, what a great idea. So I created this pro, this class 
um, and presented it to to them, and they absolutely loved it, and um, asked me to you know come on as a as adjunct professor. So that happened pre-COVID, and then so then they said, okay, you can do this, but it's got to be online. And I'm like, Jesus, I've never taught a class to a college level, so I'm not going to do this online. So um, so in fact, I haven't started teaching the class. Um, we're hoping that the classes go back in in September. And basically, it's all kind of um, the idea. It's it's all an intro to all these different vignettes of music business opportunities, whether it be you know booking talent, um, production, um, management, recording, recording uh, studio management, things of those things. Or uh, so we. I give a uh, the course outlines what you need to do. I give um, it's going to give people the opportunity to meet people in that industry. Of course, right now it can't be done because yeah. the industry doesn't exist. Unfortunately, it's sad, but uh, hopefully soon. Hopefully soon we'll be back. And um, and then and four by fate. Oh, we forgot about four by fate in there. That four by fate. Yes, that was four by fate. Um, a lot of a lot of fun. Fun band. I was um, unfortunately they were recording their album, and, and AJ Perro from Twisted Sister was the drummer, and unfortunately he passed away while they were in the middle of that album. Um, the guys in Four by Fate was started by John Regan and, and Todd Howard, who, who were the uh, original members of Freely's Comet, and um, John went on to play with Peter Frampton for 30 years, uh, and then also Pat Gasparini, great songwriter, and did a lot of the songwriting for us for Four by Fate. Um, so we did that. I think it was about two, 2016 that, that that came together, and we did. We toured Australia and did some dates. Before by Fate, we released an album called Relentless. Great group of guys. We had a lot of fun doing that. You know, um, commercial success wasn't there, but we had fun, and it was a, it was a great opportunity to play new music and, and tour again. So. Yeah. Did you, do you guys have anything, you know, possibly on the horizon for that? Cause I mean, I know you guys of course released that first record. Is there, did you guys ever toy around with the idea of doing another one? Well, we, you know, we toy around, toy around, meaning like, uh, you know, on, you know, on social, on social media or on a text, you know, say, Hey, you, Hey, you shitheads. I miss you fuckers. Let's get the band back together. You know, so, so I don't know. It, it's there's been loose conversation. Um, I would love to. I think it'd be fun to do another album with those guys. It was it was a it was a fun experience. I'd like I'd like to do it again. So I'll call them after we're done. <laughs> Actually, here, Todd. Call him right now. I want another Four by Fate album. Yeah, come on. <laughs> he won't he won't answer. He's he's too busy. Todd is Todd's in San Diego. He's he's too busy fixing his cars or something. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, that that was a fun project that, you know, yeah, like you said, he really set record. And uh, I remember when it came out and kind of you guys played the chance and did a couple, you know, shows and everything, which is really cool. How, what else have you been doing, you know, music wise? Do you, do you still write stuff for yourself, really? Or do you kind of primarily right now kind of focus on the lessons you do and, and that kind of yeah. stuff? So, you know, unfortunately for me, I'm not really a songwriter. Um, I have songwriting credits. I, I did write some of some basic parts in Skid Row, but for me to r sit down and write a song from beginning to end, you know, generally what would happen is I'd hear things in my head. I didn't, I couldn't play piano or guitar. I, well, I could play guitar, but not enough to give an idea of what I was hearing. So what I would do is I would come up with these ideas and I'd tell Snake or Scotty or Rachel, you know, play this, and then we would work around that. Same thing with Todd and John and Pat in Four by Fate, same kind of a thing. Uh, so, so no, unfortunately, I don't, I don't write music very well, um, and so you know, which is why I choose other other avenues to keep playing music and being musical, and keeping busy and and keeping it, you know, doing it as a living. Yeah, like has it been rewarding for you to teach lessons and things like that? Because you know, I, I feel like right now, especially in this kind of climate where music is in a weird place and the industry is in a weird place and all this stuff and um, you know, especially uh, not only just that, but, you know, I'm, I'm also paying very much attention to kind of over the last couple of years, you know, rock has kind of gone a little bit into the underground, not too much in the mainstream. So for you to be able to, you know, teach drummers that are learning or, you know, that are up and coming, is it, is it something that you kind of feel is really rewarding for you? Yes. 
teaching is rewarding, um, especially you know when you're trying to teach a concept or something, and, and the student isn't quite getting it, and you talk them through it, and they get it, and they play it, and then they feel this confidence, and I can see this confidence in them that, wow, I got this. And that's really exciting to me, and to be able to see one's progression as we as you know I give them lessons and um, you know I have I have a couple students like that now who I, I see their progress weekly and it's it's very rewarding yeah and where can people contact you for doing lessons on your website right primarily you can contact me through the website robafuso.com and then there's a, a info at robafuso.com I have that's actually managed um, that email I see it it's sent to me, but I'm not like, it's not me. But you, you just launched that new website. I know not too long ago. It's, it's a really, it's really nice. It's got everything. It's got everything about you. And again, like your contact and everything like that. And um, you're even starting, I know you started this new uh, kind of collections uh, thing that you've been working on. So if you want to talk a little bit about that, because I knew that that's kind of new and, and in the works for you. Yeah. Well, um, a few years back, I was asked to do that, that, uh, business school advisory board and the initial uh, meeting for that was a, a board panel and I met Brandon Steiner on there. Brandon Steiner was the owner of Steiner Sports um, based in New York and he pr was probably the biggest, Steiner Sports was probably the, the biggest music, I'm sorry, the biggest sports collectible company in the world, one of the top. Uh, he ended up selling the company, got out of that, started another company and um, had approached me about doing music collectibles instead of sports figures we do music and um, said well let's let's create something for you and then um, you will take that and you're gonna run with the music side of this collectibles uh, company so so what we do is we create unique um, pieces it's not necessarily like selling old t-shirts uh, we may, we may, the, but those are one of the kind, one of the kind auction type items. Yeah. But you know, we create, for instance, I got the cowbell, I got the cowbell that we recorded Monkey Business on. So the, the, that cowbell that I played, I got that model um, and I signed 250 of those and we're creating kind of a box with the figure from Monkey Business and the signed cowbell. And so stuff like that. And so that's what we do for me and I would do that I'm going to help other artists, other bands create those things for themselves, and it goes up on their website. It's just when when uh, when if someone like yourself wants to buy something, you go you go in to their website, you click buy, and it sends it to my shop, gotcha. their shop, their shop. But this 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 company that that are creating this, we create it with the artist, and then gotcha. they, and then they sign everything. It's all. Um, the, you know, it's all up and up, it's all legal, it's documented, so you know you're getting the real thing. So that was another thing that we did uh, during COVID, you know, um, just trying to keep busy in music and keeping the marketing wheels spinning. Um, before, you know, before Skid Row, I went to NYU for marketing and PR. Sort of didn't really use that much during the Skid Row days because we had other people doing it, but, um, you know, I always had that sense. And so as you know as skid row started to wane at the end there i was like uh oh i better put this shit to use <laughs> so, so i i fall back on on all those you know on that that um those lessons i've learned at, at, at nyu and marketing and, and ideas and still applying that to everything i do yeah i think that's so important you know and especially in the music business i mean a lot of people i feel like you know, and not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but a lot of people don't really have that, you know, under their belt, you know, so Lucky. that's such, yeah, it's such an important skill to have, you know, and, and being able to market your career and, 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 you know, press and all that stuff. So that's an important skill to have for sure. It is. Well, I, I did, I did fight my dad tooth and nail about going to college um, <laughs> and some, somehow he won and made me pay for it. I'm not sure how to. How did that happen? <laughs> I guess I wasn't a good negotiator. Maybe so. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I like, you know, you're teaching, you're going to be teaching this music business class. And, you know, it's something that is, is really important. You know, like I went, like I said, I kind of went to, 
I went to school for music business and a lot of the people that I went to school with, you know, I was somebody I went because I wanted to literally know about the music business. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a performer. I'm not an artist, but a lot of people I went to college with were performers who were trying to learn this, these skills for themselves so that, you know, when they get into a situation with having a manager or having a PR, uh, you know, publicity firm or something like they have some kind of idea about what, what work these people are doing for them, you know? And, uh, I think that, you know, it's it definitely even now, you know, I'm sure at this point in your career, like you said, it's, it's come to be a helpful skill. Nothing can replace knowledge and information, you know, yeah. so it's really up to you to know and not be taken advantage of in the business as an artist. When I went, when I decided to go to NYU, I, I frankly, well, I initially wanted to go to Syracuse. Um, because I was a huge basketball fan and I was a big Syracuse basketball fan and uh, I, I did play basketball in high school but I was not nearly good enough to play <laughs> at a college level so I wanted to go to Syracuse so I could play drums in the pep band you know so I could travel right. with the team. I went up there and I saw the snow drifts were higher than, the, than the, the trucks that were plowing the snow so I decided not to go to Syracuse. I went to NYU because I figured, well, if I'm going to be, if I want to be a drummer, if I want to get into the business as a drummer, as a musician, I should be in New York City, and um, you know, at this point, and learn learn about, you know, learn the business of this, all the while trying to forward my career as a musician. So I really wanted to be a musician. Um, I probably wouldn't have been happy being on the business side early on. So I'm glad. I'm really glad that it worked out. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about kind of how that transition happened for you when you were going to school and then you got into Skid Row, because I mean, I've heard a little bit about this, Justin, and being a, a music fan and being a fan of the genre and the band, but I haven't really heard it from you. And so I, I would, I'm curious as to how that kind of happened. Well, it's, it's, it's quite a long story because there's many players and it, it, it was over some time. So I'll, I'll do my best to, um, to uh, give you a, a edited version of it. Um, it started, um, I had a, a, a girlfriend who became my wife, who became my ex-wife, um, who introduced me to David Bryan, keyboard player from Bon Jovi. Um, there, was, there was that angle, and then there was another friend who, I, a mutual friend I had that knew Snake. So this was just random, random life stuff, and so I was playing in a band in South Jersey called the Sutton Thomas Band, very different, it was more of a kind of progressive pop band along the lines of maybe Tears for Fears, that kind of a vibe, and um, Bon Jovi was breaking with uh, Runaway on WAPP back then, and I heard that he was going to be auditioning drummers, so I tried to get an audition for this. Now it took about a year uh, between, it was mostly, it was mostly uh, David, Brian, that helped, helped with that. And um, so I had been learning, you know, I was, wasn't really a rock and roll drummer at this point. I was really more of a progressive rock kind of guy, more, uh, more pop. And I was at the beach and I got a call, hey Rob, can you be at the studio in two hours? Well, the studio is an hour from where I was in North Jersey. And I was at the beach and my drum set was in the studio. I said, sure, what am I going to say? Yeah. So I, so I run home. I had a, I had a Toyota Corolla and a, and a 15 piece drum set. So I, I took the necessary, necessary items I could fit into the car. I ran home, you know, I had my shorts on. I put, I went, I think I went to the audition flip flops. I, I forgot to put my shoes on. I was so excited. <laughs> so I got there right on time, set up and played. Uh, I auditioned for Bon Jovi uh, with Richie and Alec and John and um, obviously not Tico, but uh, and David and uh, and Snake happened to be there. Snake was good friends with John, so after the audition, he came up to me and said, "Hey, I don't really know how this is going to work out with John, but if things don't work out, I'm putting his band together with a buddy down at um, in uh, Tom's River uh, Music Store, and um, you know maybe if it doesn't work out, let's let's connect." So I said, "Sure." So eventually, it didn't didn't work out. Snake and I connected got the audition and that's how I got into school. Yeah, I mean like that just started a whole that was a whole journey and I mean you cuz you obviously of course got into the band prior to Sebastian joining. So that you guys were kind of the right the initial kind of group it and then Sebastian Snake. joined later. It was Snake, Rachel and I 
and then um, and then Scotty. Now I think Matt uh, Matt Fallon was the original singer. He was sort of in and out at the time, but I then Scotty came along. I remember Matt was still in the band, and then and then we would we would have rehearsals and shows, and Matt wouldn't show up, so we had to let Matt go. <laughs> and it took us about two years to find Sebastian, who came through Mark Weiss. I know you had Mark Weiss on the on the show. Yeah, um, I saw I saw your picture. Um, you you posted. So Mark Mark had Sebastian. Uh, Mark saw Sebastian sing at a wedding. It might have been his. No, it wasn't his wedding, but it was up in in Canada. And um, he said, "Man, you got to check this guy out." So after a year and a half or so of looking for a singer, we we found Sebastian, and he came down, and that was it. Yeah, and, and talk. You know, you just mentioned you know talking with Mark Weiss, and I love the the one picture because I I'm sure obviously you've seen his book and, and everything like that. You know, he has one picture in there of you guys. And you guys were so glammed out, and it's the one picture. <laughs> you guys were so glammed out, and I I oh, saw that I picture. Like young girls. <laughs> was was that? I'm curious because was that like the band's direction, or was that so, like at that time were you guys just trying to find out if you guys were going to be that type of like image band or or anything like that, or was that something that Mark was like, try this? No, no, no we were we were going. That's a good question. We were we were going. Um, really, you know, for the glam metal type thing. And um, I don't remember, but you'll see that's that's about the only picture you're going to see of us that glam. Thank God. <laughs> for me, and you know what? Uh, Rachel was totally, totally into that. He, you know, he was a punk, punk glam dude, and that's that served him really well. You know, it was, it was, it was, that was really, um, for that moment, in that picture, that was something, trying to be something that I wasn't. Right. So I'm glad, I'm sort of glad that didn't, didn't stick. Um, but, you know, there was still a glam side to the band. It was just a little edgier and dirtier. Yeah. And that was more, that was, that's sort of, we fell into this is, this is who we are. And that made a lot more sense. Right. Yeah. I, it's so funny that one picture. Yeah. It's, I've never seen, like you said, it's like the only picture like that. And yeah, it's, it's, I've never seen anything like that before. Cause you still have like, you know, Sebastian was in. Do you have it there? You can pull it up. I don't have it right here right now. Um, but I'll, I'll insert it when I do the editing, I'll put it up here so that everybody can see it. Um, okay. but it's one of those things. I mean, like cause Sebastian, I know kind of came from Madam X, I believe he was in and he had the, he had the huge hair and that kind of ended. He was totally, in, totally into the glam scene as well. Yeah. He right. Came, right. Michael, yeah. Michael Monroe was one of his idols. Yeah. Yeah. So that, if you guys haven't seen that picture, yeah, I'm going to put it up right now. So you <laughs> try not to embarrass Rob. That's, that's going to be right here. It's, it's, um, a lot but, of people love that. A lot of people love that picture. It was, it was, that was before, I mean, that was early, early, early Skid Row. Yeah. It's about the earliest, the earliest yeah. of all, the all five of you together. That was before anybody ever heard the album. Which is incredible. I mean, for you, you know, it must be, you know, even hearing kind of like, you know, me talk about it. And I know you get this a lot because, you know, people, you know, talk about Skid Row and, and just the importance of that band and their lives and everything. I mean, for you, is it crazy to kind of reflect back on this journey and, you know, that first album and even Sleep to the Grind, which was even bigger than that first album? You know, just a legacy that those two records especially have had because, you know, it's over 30 years later, you know new fans are getting into those albums every day it's one of those things where it still gets played on the radio it's still it's still recognized um you know heavily by by music fans so is it something for you that's kind of surreal and that you kind of never imagined would happen well you give me the chills just saying those things to be <laughs> honest with you no you never you never realize you know you never expect that i mean i just the other day i was sort of reminiscing about the early days before we even got our record deal and but just knowing all that there was all this anticipation and all this movement around the band and excitement and me thinking to myself i'm getting chills again thinking wow my dream might come true you know i want to be a rock star this is happening and it was pretty special and um you know to then <clears throat> then actually realize that dream and then have the music you've created be pieces of music that have stood the test of time for 30 years and people are still asking you to sign their, their albums and sending you things and and you know even though I'm no longer in the band um, 
and that that current lineup doesn't exist anymore it was still a huge piece of rock and roll history and i'm i'm really honored to be a part of it yeah it's you know one of those things where that's you know even for my life and uh, you know my parents life and you know my mom's life and it's a big it's a big you know part of the soundtrack to uh-huh. somebody's life yeah i will i will tell <laughs> I will tell her hello because uh, it's, it's, you know, without my parents, I always say this, a lot of my listeners know this, you know, I was heavily influenced by my parents with my music taste. And, you know, I grew up listening to that first album and to Youth Gone Wild. And, you know, that's like, when I was very young, that's what I was listening to. And so, you know, it's really, it really has to the test of time. And, you know, I'm, I'm not the only one. There's peers that I have that love the band and that, especially that lineup of the band, you know, just as much as I do. And so, you know, I think, yeah, it must be, it must be incredible for you. Cause I mean, I know that you also, you know, occasionally uh, back in 2019, you did, I saw Sebastian back in 2016 and it, at the chance and you came up and played a couple songs and you know you still have the opportunity to, to play those songs occasionally when Sebastian and you are in the same place. So for you, it must also kind of be, you know, fun to get up there and, and play those, play those old songs with him. Of course it is. Um, it's also nerve wracking, to be honest, uh, you know, because they're up there doing it every night. And <laughs> and I have to remember these songs that I recorded 20 years ago or 30 years ago. But it's it's a, it's great. And it's always great to see him. It's always great to see the other guys. I don't, uh, you know, we're, we're now all over the country, different places. I'm on the East Coast. Sebastian's on the West Coast. Rachel's in the middle of the country in Nashville. Snake goes back and forth from there to New York. Scotty's in L.A. So... You know, I don't really see those guys very much. Um, Sebastian does reach out when he comes through the New York area or any, anywhere in the, the Northeast and see if I want to come by, which is really cool. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Does he give you a little bit of a warning so you have some time to like have a refresher or does he just yeah, give like, you a call that morning? You know, like <laughs> like at 4 p.m. of the day of the show, dude, where are you, man? I'm, I'm going to be at the chance tonight. Why don't you come just come up and play a couple tunes? <laughs> is it really that late? Sometimes, yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, and then there's, you know, there's uh, the time I, I recent, my most recent time was just before COVID. I played with him in, at the Sony Theater in New York City. Um, were you there? I was not there because I was waiting for him to come here, and then COVID happened, and so I never got to see that show because he was supposed to play here and like. And I think like the, the May or the June or something. And then, you know, we know how that happened. We had discussed, we had discussed uh, that I was going to come out on a couple of shows with him. And then, right. And so then those all, and they were all going to be a surprise, but um, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully next year we'll do, do a few of those. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's at this point, I mean, he's rescheduled that tour again. And I, I think now he's rescheduling it again. And it's like, oh, I just want it. And now it's like the 32nd anniversary of the album because it's supposed to be the 30th it was the 30th right? he started it as a 30th anniversary <laughs> well you know what and such is life here we are but fortunately we're all good and healthy and made it through that's that's the beauty of it right you know it's the most important thing you know i'm in i want live music back as much as anybody but you know it's it's important to you know trying to do it in a safe way and make sure everybody's safe while doing it and not not rush into into doing it you know, I, all of us want it back, you know, but it's going to take a little bit of time. But I mean, with those those two albums, you know, like I said, you know, the first album, Enslaved to the Grind, you know, is there is there any, uh, like either one really more memorable for you than the other one? Um, I mean, I know that they're both kind of very important albums for you in your career, but when you look back on making both of those and recording them and just that time, you know, which one kind of really stands out to you? Well, you know, each one has a has a very memorable aspect. Of it, the first one uh, was just that—the first one that we have we had never done an album before. And again, like I said, all the excitement and the the hype that was around this new band Skid Row, who was going to be, you know, Atlantic Records' um, answer to Guns N' Roses. Uh, I don't think we I don't think we got quite that far, but you know, we certainly did well, um, and were. Atlantic Records, Guns N' Roses, basically at that time. But um, you know, being being in the studio, I remember just the anticipation, and I remember Michael Wagner at, uh, towards the end of the album, the recording process, saying, "He says, guys, this is this is a really strong album." He said, "I I could see easily see this going platinum, maybe several times platinum," and we were all like, "Are you kidding? You know, shut up!" and and 
because you don't really think that's possible. Um, only other people can do that. But uh, so that anticipation and that excitement as really young, you know, rookie rock stars uh, made it really special. The 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 innocence that we had, and then Slave to the Grind um, was a much more aggressive, heavy heavy metal album than the first one. Um, and we also wanted to do that and keep a, um, a, a real sense of ourselves and not go too far away from, you know, the, the sing-along chorus, the power, you know, the powers of the sing-along chorus, and, but still keep it heavy and, and rock and roll. And going into that, I, I have to say, it was very nerve-wracking because we had such success of the first album. And um, going in and recording Slave to the Grind, which we did in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which did not make things easy to concentrate. <laughs> uh, we, we, we were, we were, we're very good, but when it's time to, to perform and record, we're very straight. We're always very straight and, you know, focused. But afterwards, we partied pretty hard all the time. So, um, but that, so, in any case, so, you know, going in and trying and trying to focus and make this great album that was going to be a follow up to the first one is a lot of pressure. You know, you have your whole life to write this first album, and you have a year to write the second album. I don't know if you've heard that before, yeah. but but it's it's very true. Um, so there's two very different experiences, and I remember being on the bus when that album was released. We were just going out on tour. Uh, and management came in and said, congratulations, guys, Slave to the Grind debuted at number one on Billboard charts, and I have that, I have that right there on my wall. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe they'll take you for a little tour here. Um, so there's very different, very different experiences there, but both were very important. And you know what, honestly, even um, the Besides Ourselves album, I don't know, I love that, that was so much fun. You know, we did that on tour, on our days off, we'd, we'd find, a, you know, we'd have a studio picked out. We'd pick a song that each one of us loved or from a band each one of us loved, and we went and recorded it. And it was, that was so much fun. And there was no pressure because it was just fun. And, yeah. um, you know, that, that memory, every one of the songs, I remember the studio and the, and the you know, the, there was, like I said, there was no pressure. Um, and we put a lot of pressure on ourselves in the studio to be great. And then the, the final, the, um, Subhuman Race album, frankly, is one of my favorite albums to perform because um, I sort of is Bob Rock sort of took the the chains off of me and and let me let me really go and experiment as a drummer and be a little bit more of the drummer that I was used to be being before Skid Row. Michael Wagner really made me focus, eliminate a lot of drum fills, keep keep it simple, stupid, um, and. Obviously, it works, um, but Stop Human Race, we made it a little bit different. I loved it. I love that album. I loved recording it. I think the guys the guys didn't love it as much, but uh, and that was also kind of a weird time. The record company was making changes. The industry, you know, Nirvana came out, Pearl Jam came out. The industry was changing. We started infighting, and and sadly, that sort of was the start of the demise of Skid of that Skid Row. Now, I know you kind, of, you kind of talked about before you got into Skid Row, you were kind of more of a tears for fears, you were in that kind of kind of uh, field. Now, when you were kind of looking at your future and your goals of becoming, you know, a professional musician, were you originally kind of looking for a hard rock, you know, type band? Or was that something that you were kind of willing to take any opportunity and, and kind of run with it? Well, exactly. I was willing to take it. And, and I said tears for fears off the top of my head because... Um, I just remember they did a lot of sequencing stuff, and I mean, I was more of a progressive rock drummer. I liked Genesis, I liked, uh, but I also loved ACDC, and I loved, um, I loved Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, but I also loved Led Zeppelin. So you know, I was sort of all over the map on there, um, but not really, you know, at that time I I didn't love. I wasn't a Metallica guy. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't into that hard thrash metal at that time. Yeah. Uh, but so. So yes, I, I wanted to be in a band that was big and powerful. I didn't know what that meant. Strong, big, big, strong, aggressive sound. And I think, I think I got that. Yeah. <laughs> I I got that. 
Yeah. And I, like you said, even with, um, you know, Slave to the Grind, you know, that was something, I mean, you guys went from, you know, kind of touring with other, other bands and when that first record came out and then you guys ended up touring, you know, with Pantera, which was, you know, they kind of grew up to be a, a heavier that was an band. Amazing tour. That was an amazing tour. That's the, the friendship we developed. Got, it's, that was a special time. Yeah. Yeah. Because like you said, it was right before kind of, I mean, that time period was right before the industry kind of changed and, and grunge kind of came in. So it was like right, right on the cusp where, you know, it was kind of the perfect timing for that, that album to come out, like right, right at well, that year. Well, that's what we were going for. Yeah. Actually, so, um, and it was lucky as well. Yeah. So I won't keep you for too much longer, uh, but at the end of every single one of my interviews, I ask the same five questions that I call the metal from the inside five. And they're just kind of vague questions that just allow my audience to get to know my guests a little bit better. Uh, questions that typically aren't too asked in interviews. But uh, the first question is, if you weren't in the profession that you're currently in, which I guess we touched on a little bit earlier, so drummer or musician, what do you think that you would be doing? Well, I always said I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I wasn't smart enough to do the math. That's why I became a drummer. I only had to count to four. <laughs> um, you know, I have a love for animals. I thought I wanted to do that. Um, I think I, always, I was pretty sure I always wanted to be a drummer. Um, I actually thought maybe I would, I would, uh, I loved playing timpanis in the orchestra. I thought maybe I would play timpanis in a symphony or perhaps uh, drums in a pit band for, for a Broadway play, for Broadway stages. So those were all things, but I, a lot of it was being a drummer, you know. I, I didn't expect to be famous um, and, and do, you know, what happened. So when you're, when you're working on life's plans, you have to put it out there and go for it. And those, those were all options that I was willing to, to have as my story. Yeah. And, and what was your introduction to the drums originally uh, when you started? Well, um, I will, I will send you a picture. <laughs> I will send you a picture you could put up. Uh, I started playing drums in my diapers on the floor with pots and pans and my mom's utensils. So that's when I started playing drums. She, um, she allowed me to play drums, uh, to the TV, to any music show, like Don Kirshner's rock concert, I could, would stand up and play the snare drum or, or whatever in front of the TV. So it was sort of really born, it was in me right from the get go. Yeah, that's so, that's so interesting because it's almost like it chose you in a way, you know, it's, it's, you know, started from before you probably could even really remember, you know. And did you like eventually go on to like play in like your school band or anything like that? Was that kind of how yeah. you're? Yeah, I started, I started taking lessons in, in second grade in, in elementary school uh, and played there and then couldn't wait to get into, you know, the junior high and I started playing in the jazz band, playing the drum set there and um, that's when I found out girls like drummers. <laughs> so, I had all these girlfriends in junior high because I played the drums. I thought they liked the quarterback, but <laughs> like the drummer too. So I wanted to be the quarterback and the drummer. <laughs> I wanted a monopoly. Yeah, two for one, yeah. <laughs> Well, I wasn't quite good enough to be a quarterback. I was a, I was a receiver. I did play football, but um, and I played in marching bands. I loved marching bands. I actually used to march like in the St. Patrick's Day Parade and the Macy's Day Parades, carrying the big triplets. And I loved the power of all those drums. Uh, and and then and then high school, and then I played in the symphony and you know all that stuff. And yeah. we actually did a tour of the states with the well a few states with my high school symphony. That was a lot of fun. And um, and then into college, you know, in college I didn't I didn't play really organized band. I took drum lessons and played, you know, with my rock bands around. Yeah. And I was also I was also the designated official party guy for the dorm. <laughs> and I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure like doing too like all of those, you know, like a jazz band and and a, you know symphonies and and all this stuff. It kind of really made you versatile as a drummer. I'm sure you know doing a bunch of different styles and all and all that stuff. That and it makes you hear things differently. Um, it makes you approach playing differently. It makes you hear a song differently. You have different you have different tools to create with. Um, so yeah, it opens up the palette. I think you know, like a, an artist palette, it opens up a musical palette a little bit more having those those skills. Uh, the second question that I have for you is, what is something that you wish everybody knew about you? 
And this is when I, when I often say that, I mean, like, do you have a, a secret talent that somebody may not know about or uh, a guilty pleasure, like musician that you listen to that nobody would think something like that? That's a really hard question. Um, not because I don't want to share it. I just, um, I love to be a farmer. I am not really a farmer, but I love, uh, I have a horse farm and I love to tend to the ground and, and um, just be a farmer. And, you know, that's, that keeps me grounded to the earth and, and sane and gives me a, a purpose when there's no other purpose. I have um, the life around me to take care of. And so I, I love that's, that's, you know, going out on the tractor. I have a big John Deere tractor. <laughs> and when did you when did you get that farm? Like how long ago have or how long have you been doing that? Well, my um, my ex wife had wanted a horse, so we we got her a horse. It was on three acre. We were on three acres in, in South Jersey, and it wasn't really quite big enough for a horse. But uh, just so randomly later on I, I've always loved horses I'm not necessarily a rider you know it's not a passion but I, I do like horses I like the energy they bring to uh, uh, to your property and um, and they're just they're quite amazing animals and so I just uh, I felt like it was in the in the late uh, it was actually late 90s early 2000s I was like you know what I really need to find property with the space and I wanted an old 1800s house and old barn so it's just rent you know you put it out there to the universe there happened to be one for sale right by my best friend's house so I was I would go I was a god godfather to his daughter and I would go visit them and I would drive past this farm that was for sale it was a mess but that was part of the beauty of it because I got to make it mine so I ended up buying and closing the house on September 11th 2001 the day of the attack so that was also a very bittersweet moment um you know literally we closed on the house but uh then just couldn't um we couldn't finalize the bank so right it was all closed so that's how that happened but yeah farming and and uh and horses yeah that's something that definitely that's a good answer to that question because i mean i knew because we talked we talked about it briefly but you know no i that, you didn't know i was gonna say that <laughs> I know you're gonna say that, but I knew about it because you were like when we were trying to set this up. You had talked about the farm, so I was like, I know he has a farm, but I know something a lot of fans, you know, Skid Row fans, probably I'm sure had no idea about that. That's something that you do now, so that's a good answer to that question. I don't, really, I don't come across as the farmer guy, <laughs> but I do. I love it. I do love it. Yeah. Uh, the third question is the stereotypical question that a lot of people do ask, but I ask it anyway. Um, if you could, uh, or if you were stranded, let me try this again. If you were stranded on a desert island and you only had three records, this is everybody's reaction. It's so great. Three records to bring with you to listen to off the top of your head. Uh, what would they be? You suck. <laughs> it's usually five. <laughs> nope. Nope. We're going even lower. It's three. <laughs> um, well, I have to. I think the very, the very first one that just comes to mind is uh, "Vulgar Display of Power." Great one. There's. I would probably, you know, I would probably bring one from a few different genres. I would have to bring. I would have to bring an old soul Motown record. Which, uh, God, um, how about I could say pr probably something. Probably something Otis Redding. Temptations, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and that would be actually that would the second album would be a collection of all of those artists that I made. A compilation, yes. A compilation that I made, yeah. How's that? And then I need I would need a chill. I would need a chill. Um, I would need a chill like I like I love. Uh, well, you know I love I love James Taylor. I love Sophie B. Hawkins. I don't know if you know who she is. Um, uh, so I would need a chill album, but I would say I would say a James Taylor, uh, a James Taylor album. Um, but he's got so many great albums too. But it, it would be a chill James Taylor. Yeah. So I could, you know, I could sit by the water listening to chill James Taylor, waiting for somebody to come 
rescue come me. rescue you i mean that's a good you got a good mixer you got a heavy record you got kind of a fun fun record and then you got something to kind of relax to i got yeah so i would right so i would i would so i would play i would play the the pantera to, to do my workouts and and to just release steam and then <laughs> then i would play right then i would then i would play the 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 motown record to party to and then i would play the james taylor to chill and watch the uh watch the waves and, and, I, and I know we kind of mentioned uh, a little while ago the Pantera, and then you're picking Pantera again. Um, and I'm kind of just curious: did you have any kind of relationship or, or friendship with Vinny? Because uh, I know you guys, you know, toured together, and you know, uh, rest, you know, rest his soul, and, and everything is such a such a uh, you know immense loss. But you know, did you guys develop uh, friendship during that time? I absolutely did. Um, actually, mo with most of the guys, we were all very close. Um, with Vinny and Dime, I I had the I had the sweetest call from Daryl. I kept it on my phone for years and years and years. I just I just got a message from him. It it was probably probably mid two thousand. I don't remember the year. And he said, Hey, dude, it's Dime. Just looking at what you're doing. It looks like you're happy, man. It's happy to see you happy. Lots of love, bro. Good luck. Miss you. Uh, you know, it, it was just, there was no reason, it just reached out and it was just so touching out of nowhere. Yeah. You know, and that was, uh, that was the last time I heard from him. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> Vinny, Vinny as well, I just, um, we, <laughs> we hung out a lot. I remember when Vinny was coming on the tour, we were with Guns N' Roses and we were playing in Dallas and I said to Matt Sorum, I said, dude, we both better start fucking practicing because listen to this guy who's come. <laughs> This is a guy who's going to be opening up, and, and he, he Matt says to me, he's like, "Holy fuck, dude! I'm glad that's not me," <laughs> because they were touring, going out touring with us. <laughs> so Vinny, you know, I was very impressed with Vinny's skills and his feet and his speed, and and he's just a just a great guy. And I probably never, never in my life got more drunk than I did with with the Pantera guys. Yeah, it's just, it just, I mean, it makes sense though, right? It makes sense. <laughs> it was, um, it was just a really special time in all of our lives. Yes, we all, we all had special friendships that some lasted longer than others. Um, and, you know, I remember those really very much fondly. And, and it, when, when Dime, I remember I was sound asleep and I had this incredible awakening at like 4 a.m. and I got up and I heard a gunshot. And I heard a gunshot in my head, and I woke up. My my adrenaline was like a bad dream. <clears throat> and at six a.m., I got a text from our publicist saying, "Hey, Rob, I don't know if you heard, Daryl was shot, killed last night." And I'm getting chills again because. Yeah. So we had we had this unwritten non. There was no. It's not like we were best friends, but there was a soulful connection there, and with Daryl. Um, and with Vinny, but for some reason that happened with time and it was just, it was really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you weren't, you know, the closest friends afterwards, you know, it's somebody who played a, a big, you know, at that time, you know, in your life, you know, was somebody who was there and played a big role in your life. And I mean, I think it's, I think it's only natural to, to feel that loss, you know, it doesn't really matter how long. Absolutely. No, you're right. Did you, by the way, did you, have you seen the, the videos? Did you see our, our, our uh, the Pantera videos and Skid Row videos? Of the, oh, yes. The softball yes. games. <laughs> Which I, I mean, I, I love that, you know, hearing stories like that and even seeing videos like that, of that you guys were such good friends, because I think that, you know, it's, it's for you and it probably you looking back on it, you know, remembering it now, you know, said it was, it was such a great time and it was such a great tour and, you know, it's, it's making that, that time so memorable, you know what I mean? You kind of look back on that and it was, it was something that you were living your dream and you were having fun and you had great people around and it must have been a blast. And we would go out and just be, you know, young goofballs, uh, <laughs> you know, that nobody, nobody could really see us in our goofiness, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Pantera was just one of those bands, which is funny. Pantera also had their own little glam period, which often goes a little unnoticed. I know you, they had their glam period, those those three records before they before they became the Pantera that everybody knows now. So you guys had that in common, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 
Um, the fourth question I have for you is what is one piece of advice that you would give to your younger self if you could? Try to be present more in the moment and not look so f forward ahead. You can, look in, you can look ahead, but be present now yeah. at the moment because <laughs> there's, things, <clears throat> there's things that I don't remember because I wasn't present that I wish I remembered. Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh God, it's like, what's that saying? It's like the past is something and the future is something and the present is a gift, you know, like that. I mean, that was really awful. I totally just forgot the rest of the quote, but the present is a gift. So that's, that's the synopsis of that quote, but it's very, I, <laughs> I, I wish I, I like heard it in my head and I was like, the past is something and the Let future. Let me give you one of these. But it's true. I think, you know, sometimes I get that way too of like, I think it's natural. You're going through life, right? You're kind of, you're always, you know, when you're also like a goal driven person too, you know, a lot of the time it's what, what can I achieve next? Or what can, what's the next thing on the, on the radar or the list? And, you know, sometimes, yeah, it's important to be like, you know, it's, it's great to accomplish things and have your eyes set on other things, but, you know, it's also important to, to recognize where, where you are right now, which I, you know, I think it's only natural human nature, right? Uh, yes. Um, you know, there's that, that, there's that poem or saying about the journey, you know, like, um, life isn't, a, you know, don't look at life as, as where you're going to look at. Yeah. You are. So exactly that. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. I always, I always say, um, it's, I always ask this question too, cause it's always so nice for me to hear inspirational stuff. <laughs> I'm always like, yes, I was like, leave the, leave the interview, like feeling like inspired. Um, but the last question I have for you is more of a fun question. Um, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? I know this is really silly because we can sort I would like to fly. Now I say it's kind of silly because humans can fly, but we can't fly like a bird. Like, yeah. like you know, there's, I, I wish I could, you know, there's there's jumping out of planes and, and a parachute, but then I have to trust the parachute. There's the there's those I don't even know what those called those crazy fuckers that, that have have those suits on. Oh yeah. They jump off of high mountains and they fly. I mean that's pretty cool too, but again you're you're depending on the suit and your skills going at 300 miles an hour through the sky. I would if you get a bug in your eye. Yeah. <laughs> I just wish that I would, like, like, I wish I could fly and soar. Like, I, I have hawks and eagles around my farm. And, you know, when they just put their wings out and catch catch a breeze, and it's, that would be pretty awesome. And it's kind of, you know, kind of like in a sailboat. You just, you feel the wind. You feel the power of the wind. Yeah. So I want to be in control of it. I want to be in control of the wind. I don't yeah. Want, I don't my devices to be in control of the wind so there is a little bit of control freak going on there but i wish i could fly thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the podcast and uh, it was like i said it was so great to have you on and you know we're, we're from the same area which is even cooler i you know don't know a lot of uh you know fellow rock stars and people in this industry that you know live live in no middle town in newburgh so it's it's cool to have you on <laughs> I don't know if that's, I, I don't want that really on my tombstone, I think. But I don't. Well, I feel like my area is like such, I don't know, like growing up, you know, is one of those things where I always knew. And it's funny because, you know, I think people recognize the area because of like the chants and Poughkeepsie and all that stuff. But, you know, it's not, it's not very common that people kind of, you know, know that, that, that kind of, it's not quite upstate, but it's not quite New York City. And it's like this well, weird. That's part, of, that's part of what I love about the area, frankly, is because there's so much from here. You know, first of all, is a, it's it's beautiful, the, the, the beautiful mountains and countryside and farms, and only 90 minutes to my apartment on the Upper East Side, and is two hours to just about any beach, you know, South Jersey or, or the Hamptons, um, go skiing up in the mountains in upstate New York or Vermont, you know, so there's everything okay. here, it's, but we don't want too many people to know about that, so don't, don't air that. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you so much again for taking the time um, for coming to coming on. You know, I, I know uh, I did a little bit getting this together, but I was so happy that to have you on and uh, but, everything like that. I'm glad we stayed at it. Thanks so much for having me. You're great. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate absolutely. It.